morning to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 14. Matthew 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Three verses before us this morning. And the Lord has made it simple for us because we can follow the same structure. <coughs> Three points. First of all, in verse 14, he gives a statement. And second, in verse 15, we have an illustration and in verse 16, we have the application. So a statement, an illustration, and an application. So this is from the Lord of preachers, not the Prince of preachers, but the Lord of preachers. So first, we should look at the statement. The Lord Jesus said in verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. Before I explain more on the statement, we remember earlier Jesus said to his disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth. And there are parallels, but also contrasts between salt and light. Uh, we wouldn't dare to recapitulate anything going back on what we said on, on, on the salt earlier on. But it's important to remind ourselves that salt and light make their presence to be known and to be felt. The absence of salt is quickly noticed. The absence of light also is quickly noticed. Actually, salt and light are indispensable. Indispensable for life, for normal life, and for good life. But even though we can bring parallels between salt and light, there are great contrasts between, between both of them. Salt penetrates, salt preserves, salt prote protects from within. But light works from without. Light projects itself. Just imagine your world or our world without light. Light seems to be everywhere nowadays, especially in the West, that we take things for granted and we have forgotten what it looks like to be the dark night. So, to come back to what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, ye are the light of the world. Another contrast we can see is that the contrast between light and darkness is a very common subject in the Bible. So we leave the salt aside, now we come to our, our subject. Light and darkness is a very common subject in the Word of God. And we remind ourselves that light describes God himself. Light describes the truth. Light describes purity. Light describes heaven. But darkness describes or pictures the opposite. <coughs> darkness pictures sin, depravity, arrogance, promiscuity. Darkness describes hell, but darkness describes also the devil. And we remember, brothers and sisters, that sin brought spiritual darkness into this world. Sin is the cause of every spiritual darkness in the life of men and women. And in John chapter 3, verse 19, 20, Jesus said, Men do not want to come to the light. Why? Because when you come to the light, it exposes, it shows who you are. So that's why even people refusing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the reason? Because they don't want their sin to be put 
outside. They don't want their sin to be forgiven. They don't want their sin to be exposed. <coughs> darkness, most evil is done in darkness. Most evil, if not all evil, is done in dark places. But we remember, the Bible says that God is light. I wish I could go into the verses, but 1 John 1, 5, God is light. <coughs> and in James 1, verse 17, we are told that God is the Father of all light. And you can see the parallel now from moving to the Old Testament to the New Testament. In Genesis 1, verse 3, the first thing God created, the first thing he created when he has spoken, he said, let there be light. And so you can see how light is so important because it's an attribute of the living God. And in so many ways, when you read the gospel, the gospel of John, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. John 8 verse 12. I am the light of the world. So you can see the relation. The God of the Old Testament who is light is the Jesus of the New Testament who said, I am the light of the world. Which means without the Lord Jesus Christ, we live in darkness, in spiritual darkness. And there is no hope in the heart, there is no hope in the life, and there is no hope in the future. Oh, just if we can scan a, a, a quick, a quick scan, glance in what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of John. more I read the Gospel of John, I believe it should be called the Gospel of Light. The Gospel of Light, starting from chapter 1, where we have the testimony of John the Baptist about the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 8 and 9, John 1 verse 8 and 9, I wouldn't want to spend too much time on this because there is more, more to come. Verse 8, he was not that light, so John the Baptist was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9, that was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. So who is Christ? He's the light. The light. So everything else is just darkness. I mentioned already John 8 verse 12, and you can see John 9 verse 5. John 9 verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And uh, John 12, John 12, there are many more, many more occurrences about light. But John 12, and here we can see a great statement uh, given by the Lord Jesus Christ. John 12, verse 25. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. And the last one, in the same chapter, verse 46. Oh, this is a great one. No prophet. No man, no religious leader has ever said, I am the light of the world. Never. But the Lord Jesus Christ in John 12 verse 46 said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So back to Matthew chapter 5 verse 14, Jesus said to his disciples, I, ye are the light of the of the world and Israel uh, to just to uh, to, make, to, to, to to complete this aspect on, on life Israel was called or chosen and selected to be a light to the nations and to shine Zechariah chapter 4 but they failed and in the Old Testament the candlestick which was uh, which was in the tabernacle had seven branches and later, when Solomon built the temple, the same candlestick now had ten branches. And I'm mentioning this because the seven branches in the tabernacle and the ten branches of the candlestick in the temple were supposed to be lightened 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never to quench, because that light 
pictures the presence of God in the midst of his people. So you can see, life is quite an important subject in the word of God. And uh, uh, when the people left the, uh, Egypt, uh, they were slaves in Egypt, when they left Egypt, they were led by a pillar of life. But there is, there is a question. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says that the devil is able to disguise himself as an angel of light. So we must be careful when, when Jesus said, "Ye are the light of the world. <laughs> Even when he said that to, to his disciples, we know later one of them in John chapter 6 is described as the evil one. So there can be true light and there can be also faithful or forceful. So Jesus said to his disciples, ye are the light of the world. Oh, what a great statement. Ye are nobody else. Not the mighty, not the wise, not the intelligent, not the kings, the governors, the scribes, the Pharisees. No, no not those kind of people. And I'm sure when Jesus said this to his disciples, they were the, the crowd. Remember, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and by extension he was speaking to a great crowd. And when he said unto them, ye are the light of the world, you can see the shock. The Pharisees were there. The scribes were there. Because the rabbis, they said, there are five things which can be light in the world. The first one is God. The second is Adam. The third one is the law, the law of Moses. The fourth one is Jerusalem. And the fifth one is the temple. So for people listening to the Lord Jesus Christ, when he said, ye are the light of the world, how could this be? Where is Adam? He's not here. Where is the temple? The temple is the light. The law of God is the, is the light. But Moses is not the light. <laughs> Elijah is not the light. But ye unlearned, small, meek, weak disciples, you just <coughs> fishers, fish, fishermen, are uneducated, but ye are the light of the world. Not a sparkle, not a candle, but ye are the light. Oh, that's a great statement. We remember, brothers and sisters, that we have received light and light. How are they similar? Life and life. How? Because Christ has worked mightily in our hearts. We are no more, no more children of darkness. We are no more children of disobedience. No more children of rebellion. But Jesus said, and the New Testament said, we are children of light. First Thessalonians 5.5. Ephesians 5 verse 8, children of light. And that's, a, that's an amazing statement. Uh, because of, uh, of uh, this identity and because the disciples have taken their identity very seriously, when you read Acts chapter 17, we are told they turn their world upside down. Just a, a, a handful of disciples, but because they really took their identity very seriously, they were able to be a light pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ to the community. But there is more. Uh, when Jesus said, ye are the light of the world, oh, he's speaking mainly to his disciples. No, no, no one else, but to the disciples. And today, we are his disciples, so we have the same, the same identity. But when he said, ye are the light of the world, what does it imply? Oh, certainly. It, it implies that this world is a dark place. That's the meaning. And uh, in the rebellion, uh, this is, I'm going back in the 18th century, men so proud have mistakenly called the 18th century the Enlightenment. This is where they thought, here we are, we will give new, new light to the world. And this is where you have all sorts of uh, all sorts of philosophers. And later, that enlightenment led to say, led some to say, God is dead. How can God lie? 
This is impossible. He is the source of all energy. He is the only one who gets his strength and power from himself. You and me, we die because we need from external resources. But God is his own energy. He cannot die. He is immortal. He is the creator. He is the cause and effect. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything to live. God cannot die. And this is why in that uh, century called the light, and actually it should be called the, the, the century of darkness, men said, we cannot know anything about anything. And you know what that, that century brought, the 18th century, it brought obscurantism, it brought uh, relativism, it brought atheism, and so on. All the isms that, uh, came through that, that so-called enlightenment. <laughs> should be called darkness. Because the truth, rather than being put before men, the truth was distorted and obscured. But the Lord Jesus Christ, John 21, Peter said, Lord, you know all things. The Lord Jesus Christ knows everything and he has put everything for us in his word. So through his word, we can know everything. Everything about God, about life. The philosopher said, know yourself, but the Bible says, no. Know God, know his word, then you can know yourself. That's the opposite. It's the, the, the complete opposite of that what this, this world is putting, putting before us. But before I, 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 I just move on, here again there is something wonderful when Jesus said, ye are the light of, of the world. So there is an exclusive and absolute truth. Truth is not relative. That's why Jesus could say, John 14, verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. They say all roads lead to Rome. Yes, all roads lead to London if you want, but not all roads lead to Rome. There is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life. It is impossible to have fellowship with God and accept by the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And Jesus said, if there was another way, he would have told us. But he is the creator. He's the bridge between men and women. He's, he's the bridge between God and man. He's the Savior. And he died to redeem sinners so that they can have fellowship with the living God. But Jesus said to his disciples, ye, ye are the light of the world. Did you notice? This is not a hope. This is not an aspiration. This is not a wish. But it is a fact. We are now only you. And again, remember, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, they didn't know much. This is just a few weeks after he has called them. They didn't know all the systematic theology. They didn't learn much from him. But at this moment, he said to them, ye are the light of the world. Brothers and sisters, just imagine about somebody or think about somebody like Peter who always said the wrong thing at the wrong time. And even when he says it right, the Lord says to him, oh, this is not from you, it's from your heavenly Father. But Christ said to Peter, ye are the light of the world. <laughs> think about some, two other men, James and John. What is their name? Born Nages, I don't know if I'm pronouncing, the, uh, pronouncing it right or not. Born Nages, which means what? Sons of the thunder. They went to a village, and that village, the Samaritan, they didn't want Jesus to go through their village. And they said, Lord, should we set fire from above and burn uh, all this village? I don't know if when they said that they are able to do it or not, but anyway, they said it. And of course, they thought they did. But these are the men to whom the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, ye are the light of the world. Not candles, not sparkles, but the light. Oh, what a great testimony. But how did they become the light? I'm trying to help. Maybe there is 
is somebody here who have never seek and find the Lord? How did they become the light? How did, were they able to be described as light? There are four steps happening to them. If you read the context, first of all, the Lord called them. Second, they listened to him. Third, they obeyed him. And four, they followed him. This is the way to become a Christian. First of all, I must hear the Lord's call. He calls us, come unto me. And second, I listen to his voice. I obey and I follow. John 10, it's all there in John chapter 10. So we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. How did they become like, like it was to Christian? How did they become Christian? They listened to the voice, they heard his call, they obeyed to his call, and they followed him and they became disciples. So that's how Jesus would call such men, ye are the light of the world. Oh, we should proceed to the second, the second step uh, of our thinking this morning. Not only he gave that statement, but now the Lord Jesus Christ will give an illustration. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bush, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Uh, it's interesting because when Jesus was telling them, "Ye are the light of the world," he was sitting on a hill. So the hill was uh, was his pulpit. He was preaching to them, and they could hear his voice. They could hear his teaching. And in the past, cities were built on a hill, first of all to be seen, but also for solidity, and the third aspect because of protection. When they are on a the hill, they could see, they could see the enemies coming from far. So when the Lord Jesus spoke to his disciples, that place, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. He is also speaking to them. And this is very important when you consider uh, the way the way he put the, the Lord Jesus Christ put it. So there will be always a sign if somebody is a Christian or not. There will always be a sign. There will always be a mark. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. A lamp, a light uh, in a darkness cannot be hidden. So he makes he makes that that relation in speaking to his disciples. So to be on a hill in the biblical language means to be in fellowship, in communion with God. But to hide your light under a bushel means to neglect the reading of the scriptures. So that's that's it's a it's a, a very figurative language. So not not to to shine and to put your life under a bushel is to neglect the reading of the word of God. To be on a hill means to have fellowship with the living God. And this is very practical because you could see your life, my life, if we are honest with ourselves, most of our troubles start when we neglect our Christian duties. What are our Christian duties? The reading of the word of God, prayer, fellowship, service, and witnessing. You neglect those aspects in your life, your life will be upside down. And this is where the devil Roaring like a lion, always ready to jump on his prey, he will not have mercy on you. So never neglect the reading of the word of God, the meditation of the word of God. That your prayer time should be important in the life of a Christian. We need one another in fellowship because in fellowship we, we uphold one another, we encourage one another. We pray for one another, we intercede for one another, we encourage one another, but also we do not intend to serve, to serve the Lord. We are saved to worship and to serve. That's our motto. We are saved to worship the Lord and to serve Him. As soon as we neglect those aspects in our Christian life, 
we are, we are in trouble. And what is the stand? Because a life needs a stand. I have never seen a life just standing by itself. It always needs a stand or something to hold it. So it is a said, we are the light of the world. What is the stand we need in our Christian life? The word of God is the stand. Because David said in Psalm 119, verse 150, Thy word is a lamp at my feet and a light on my way. A lamp at my feet to show me what is near, what is across, but also a, a light to show me a distance, what is ahead of me, what is before me. So the word of God is uh, defensive, but it also offensive. It plays, that's why it is compared as a, as a, with a sword, uh, with a double edge. So we should never put our, our light uh, in a hidden way. We must use and take every opportunity to make our light shine. The believer shines in his house, the believer <coughs> shines in his family, and Jesus makes an extension to that illustration in Luke chapter 8, verse 16. He said, when the light is on, the visitors would see also the light. So, we must do our best for visitors, for people to see the light of God shining in our lives. That leads me to the third aspect, the application. I hope this, is, this will be very practical when we look at the application. Because in verse 16, the Lord said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works <coughs> and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christ is the true light, as we mentioned earlier. He is the true light. Our lights are derived from His light. So His light causes our light to light. Without Him, there is no way that we will have light within ourselves. It's like the moon has no light. It's the, the moon is just reflecting the light of the sun. So in the same way, within ourselves we have no authority, we have no light. None of us is walking with a bar of light uh, on his forehead or in his light. But by Christ, through him, we become lights into this world. Without Him, our lives are just are just darkness. So that's the first imperative, actually. In the, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, verse 16 is the first imperative, the first command. And there Jesus said, let your light so shine before, before men. This is not a show off. It's not an exhibition, no. Christ himself condemns that. So it's not a, look what I'm doing. Look how, how great I am. That's not the purpose. But it means faith always works. We are saved by faith, but the faith that saves us is never alone. Faith works. If our faith is without works, it's, it becomes dead. It becomes demonic and it has no purpose. But remember, without faith, all our good works, everything we can do is just like a filthy rag. It has no, no measure of acceptation before the living God. So the things we do shout or speak louder than our words. Our good words must be supported by good works. And believe me, again, I'm sorry to mention this, I, 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 came from a, 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 I come from a place where most Muslims we have seen believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from the mighty work of the Holy Spirit in their life, you ask them, what brought you to the church? <coughs> and their answer is, oh, I saw the law of Christians. I saw the way the Christians are behaving. I saw the change in the life of Christians. That is what brought me to read the Bible. That is what brought me to the church to hear the gospel of Jesus. So look how they love one another. That was the, 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 the statement made in the past about Christians. Look, they are even able to die for one another. 
to sacrifice themselves for one another just because they love one another so much. Oh, brothers and sisters, good works are important in the Christian life. And the word good there, eh, it means actually, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It's, it's from that word good, we have the word uh, in English, I think it's uh, calligraphy. Calligraphy, good handwriting. So in the same way, good works, callous works, good works, pure, winsome, pleasant, that's the meaning. So let your light shine before men so that they can see your beautiful works. They can see your pleasant good works. They can see your winsome words. And what will they do when they see your good works? They will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Because God is in sinners. And through our behavior, through our testimony, God can work mightily in the life of people. So as individuals, we are lights. But as every local church also, we are a shining lamp in the darkness. In our community here, we are shining in the darkness to present the Lord Jesus Christ to the people. So before I close, uh, we have to make some applications here. I wouldn't dare to give you the number because I have a big number as always, but uh, I have improved. Uh, I will not give, give all, of, all of them to you. I hope that will be really very practical and helpful in our testimony in our life and in our outreach. But we remember, the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1 stands in the midst of his church. He stands in the midst of his church. Light lights, guides, and cheers the heart. To be called light is even greater nowadays than to be called Christian. Because the word Christian now is, is very vague. It's very vague. It doesn't mean much. But to be called light, Jesus said, "Ye are the light." Oh, that's a, a, a great privilege. It's a great testimony. As little as it can be, light changes life. It penetrates. Light is powerful. It is swift. It exposes and expels darkness. We are commanded not to take part of to the work of darkness, but to expose them. Light has many properties. And the first one, light needs contact. So we have light. Light needs contact. Light needs the contact of darkness. If, if you only live among lights, everything is bright. How can you shine? This is impossible. This is why, as Christians, we need contact with non-believers. Not to associate ourselves with them, but to shine before them so that they can see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So we need that contact because light shines only in a dark place. For a city to be seen, it must be on a hill. For a lamp to be seen, it must be on a stand. For a Christian to have a testimony, he must be in contact with non believers. Second, Light attracts. Light attracts. The closer we come to the light, the better we see. The better people see us. But spiritually, the closer we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the better we see ourselves. And you don't need me to say this, but the closer you go afar from the light, bigger your faith becomes. So the more we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, better we see our life, we see the sins in our life, and the better we want to, to be in fellowship with the living God. And far, further far we go from the light, the darkness becomes bigger. Thirdly, lights draw attention not to itself. So in the same way as Christians, we draw attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to us. Nobody, I have never seen anyone glaring, oh, what a beautiful light. And in Poland, I visited a place in the salt mine, the salt mine. 
and there is a place, a big, it's a conspicuous place. Everything in that place is made of salt. A light. You can spend a, a, a week just being amazed how, how, how people could have made such beautiful life. But at the end of the day, what you want from life is what? The light. That's the most important. It doesn't matter how, how nice or, or glittery or, or uh, shining it can be. You press the button, you want to see the light. So light do not attract attention to itself in the same way we attract attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourthly, light is pure and sensitive. Again, back, back uh, many years ago, when it was uh, a kind of uh, 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 halogen, halogen lights, I don't know if this is the way you should pronounce it or not, but those kind of economic lights came, came uh, into the market. I, I went uh, and bought one, and without, without realizing those kind of bulbs, you shouldn't touch them. <coughs> So I touched it and uh, I put the light and nothing came out. So I went back to the man I, and I said, the seller, I said, well, you sold me a wrong light, I, I want another one. Or he said, that's your mistake, you have to buy another one because you touched it. So light is sensitive, Christian also should be sensitive to sin. Oh, much could be said on that, on that part. Fifthly, Light is to shine, not to make noise. We have lights here. They make no noise. And a man had his car, and he, his car refused to stop. So he took it, he took his car to a, a mechanic, and to, with that, me the mechanic told him, the problem, you have a weak battery. But the man replied, the horn honks loudly. There is no light, but the horn Comes loud. Yes, said the mechanic, it takes more power to make a light than to make a noise. And I'm saying this not to distract you, but if you go in the streets, in Elephant and Castle, uh, East Street, and, and so on, you hear some of the preachers, the noise they make, light makes no noise. So it takes more power to make a light than to make a noise. Many go around shouting, not shining. Light works, works, and works. Even the tiny, the, the tiny light in your car or in a plane tells you something. Traffic lights. So light is to warn us. Sixth one, light is a guide. That is why lighthouse is so important to sailors into a stormy dark night. They are a lighthouse to sinners, pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his cross. Seven, light is fragile. Light is small, but is still powerful when oil is put into it and it cheers the heart. The oil is the Holy Spirit. The stone is the word of God, and we are commanded to walk and live by the Spirit. And the lamps in Bible times were very small <coughs> and could be held in a hand, but big enough to give light into a whole room. A little light can serve for a great purpose. Night one, light is to be diffused, not cancelled. A hidden light serves for nothing. The last one, light needs a source. It must get energy from somewhere else. Our strength comes from the Lord. As light, we should not be wandering here and there. We know the way. We know in whom we have believed. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Ye are the light of the world. Oh, may it be that the Lord will never remove our lampstand. May the Lord help us to think, live, as lights of the world. I close by reading Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Where we find the apostle telling us and speaking to us, making a great statement about the way Christians should behave in an ungodly uh, world. And we can see his statement in Philippians chapter 2, verse 
Ashamed to hold my Lord or to defend his cause. 